And the next session uh, with Jennifer Polka, who uh, is another Obama administration veteran, the founder and executive director of Code for America. She has a lot of knowledge and thoughts about many things we've been discussing here at this conference. Interviewed by Dan Costa, a great interviewer, an editor-in-chief of PCMag.com. So Dan and Jen, please join us. All right. Hey. Awesome. Good to see you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Absolutely. So uh, you've also, uh, you are the executive director of Code for America, mm -hmm. uh, former deputy chief technology officer at the, under the Obama administration, and helped stand up the US Digital Service, yep. which has a number of veterans on stage here today. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it, I think I want to start off with, um, you know, you've worked uh, in the, in the you worked in the White House when it, the Office of CTO was still a relatively new thing. Yeah. Um, and you helped create the US Digital Service. I think what a lot of people are asking is that now, two years into the Trump administration, mm -hmm. how is it standing up and, and, and what's the morale like inside the service? Yeah, I mean, the answer is surprisingly good. Um, and I'm, I'm really proud of that. When I was working on the United States Digital Service within the CTO's office, People would, I, I think people thought I was a little bit insane and uh, naive about how government works. And they would say, well, even if you get this stood up, it's not going to last past an administration. And one of the things that was you know, surprising to me is it didn't really exist yet. It hadn't proven its value. And I think in Silicon Valley, we would say, like, well, why don't we worry about its sustainability once it's like gotten you know, proven some value? Mm -hmm. Um, I do think it survived because it really has just incontrovertible value. Like it's, um, it's, it's solving some of the hardest problems or at least you know, cracking the nut on them. Um, the, the work that they've done at the Veterans Administration is just so powerful and, and it's fantastic. Um, and you know, you, I think a big measure of its success is not just that uh, the new administration is not only wanting to keep it around but actually grow it, but that they can still hire. Uh, that can be a tough recruitment, mm -hmm. um, but they're recruiting on the basis of you're going to save veterans' lives, um, you're, uh, you're going to help make Obamacare work, right? You're going to get people health insurance, um, uh, you're going to help save <coughs> Americans' lives in service now. The Defense Digital Service is amazing, great. That's like kind of a great pitch. You really literally are saving lives. I think, I think that's an important point, which is that we talk about modernizing government, yeah. making government work better, um, but there really are lives at stake here. Absolutely. And, and delivering government effectively, um, maybe you can give us some examples of like how people's lives are affected and changed by basically technology services. Right, I mean, um, I mentioned the, the, the VA stuff, so I'll sort of follow on to that. I mean, they had a, they had a form online that, you know, if you looked at the, the documents, the, the contracting documents, they said it works fine, you can get help, you can apply for healthcare online, but it only worked with a certain combination of, uh, of Adobe Reader and Internet Explorer, like ex that, was, that exact combination, so most people couldn't use it, and they fixed that. Um, we're working a lot at the state and local level, um, and, you know, food assistance isn't necessarily the thing you think about as saving lives, but it's, it's pretty dramatic in the life of a family that needs a little help with groceries because they're going through a tough time. Something we know is one of the most effective poverty reduction programs. It's very preventative, right? So if you don't get a family food assistance when they're eligible, um, that community, that state, that county is gonna probably pay for more expensive intervention later for that kid who is going to school without food, right? Um, and, you know, again, why are so few people on it who are eligible? In California, we were the, almost the last state in terms of participation rates. Only Wyoming had a lower participation rate of eligible people in the program. And you, you go online, you try to apply for this thing, it's a 50-page application, it doesn't work on a mobile phone, it asks 212 questions, some of which are downright insulting, almost all of which are confusing, that's why we don't have people enrolled. And you fix this, you, you, know, you get a family food when they need a little bit of help, you, you know, really provide the safety net that we think we're you know, helping people with to encourage self-sufficiency in this country, you're having a pretty big impact. So we talk a little bit about, you've worked on the federal level, you've worked on the state and municipal level. Yeah. Um, there's sort of a sentiment out there that if you really want to get things done, uh, you should work with cities and on a municipal level. Yeah. Has that been your experience? 
Um, I think there's an enormous amount to be done at the state and local level. Um, if you think about federal government, there's, um, it's a very, very, very large entity, and the parts that actually touch citizens are, are a little bit less, right? So um, the VA, certainly, IRS, these are things that can really, if we, if we fix these interactions, we can really build trust and faith and have people say, oh, actually, government does work. Um, but then people don't really distinguish, truthfully, between what's managed at the state, local, or federal mm. level. So you know, people complain about government generally, and it sort of the negative feelings often just accrue broadly. <laughs> um, so you know, the, the state stuff is super, super important. Counties, believe it or not, no one thinks like who here knows who their county executive is? Anyone? No. You know who your mayor is, right? You know who your governor is. You know who the president is. Um, but counties actually like hold all the budgets, so we work with a lot of counties too. Um, but uh, um, I, I'll give you an example of one thing that's, that's a collaboration between states and counties. Um, we have been working to clear criminal records. So these are re cl criminal records that are legally eligible to be cleared. So voters said um, if you have a low level, nonviolent, um, usually marijuana conviction, especially in California where marijuana is not actually illegal anymore. Um, you should be able to reduce it from a felony to a misdemeanor, and that gives you the ability to get a job, uh, to get student loans, to live in public housing. There's all the things that you need to sort of pull yourself up after being incarcerated. Um, but the process of doing that was bananas. It was, uh, well, it's, it, I, frankly, it sort of still is. The, you have to go to a legal clinic between 9 and 11 on Tuesdays, file a bunch of paperwork, uh, uh, go get your rap sheet, read your rap sheet, testify that it's correct even though you don't understand what it says because it's written in code. Um, stand, go before a court. It's this 10-step process that almost no one goes through. And, you know, what do you actually, you know, doesn't, it, it makes perfect sense that almost nobody has cleared their criminal record. You have to work with the counties and the states to say, there's really not a reason to make people go through this process. You can just take down the data from the DOJ database, run an algorithm to determine which of these records um, the law allows to be cleared, clear them, and upload them again to the state database. This takes an enormous amount of coordination between counties and the state and a lot of you know, legal, legal work to do this. So you worked uh, when we had a CTO. Uh, Mike yeah. Kratzios was here yesterday, yeah. holds the job that you used to have and it's almost the de facto CTO. Mm -hmm. um, are we ever gonna have a CTO again, <laughs> and do we need one? It's a good question. Um, I don't know if we're gonna have one again. I, I would assume that um, probably a Democratic presidential administration would, would appoint a, a CTO. I think the bigger question is, what is the right structure at the federal level for doing technology and digital and services better? Um, uh, I, had got, I had the great pleasure of working for Todd Park, uh, who is just an amazing human being, and he was able to get a lot of stuff done, like getting USGS set up, um, even though that wasn't really what the uh, CTO's office is supposed to do. Um, you have this issue of technology oversight kind of living in a bunch of different places, and then technology policy sort of sitting next to that. And people get very confused between the two. The, the worlds of how do you deliver better services to the American people at a lower cost and a higher quality um, have a lot in common with how we're gonna regulate self-driving cars or um, drones or something like that. But they are actually sort of two different businesses. What they both have in common is that we have to have great digital competence in government if we're gonna face the 21st century together. Get this right. Um, but it's not necessarily clear that the structure that we had is the perfect structure. And I, what I would hope is that we're in a kind of constant dialogue at the federal level, at the state level, and at the local level about how to structure organizations to do all of that much better. And it may be that we see different roles coming up and certainly different reporting structures. You, you really need to see our elected officials having digital people report directly to them, not buried deep, deep in the organization. It's one of the things that uh, it comes up all the time is that the, our elected officials just aren't digital enough. They're not yeah. savvy. They don't understand the technology. Um, is that changing? I mean, do we really just need to install a new generation of leaders in order to have that sensibility? Um, we are getting some ones that care. And I think the issue is partly in how um, the technology community has framed it. 
it is very easy to make people feel stupid about technology. It's not necessary. I don't code. Everyone seems to think that like anybody involved with you know, the technology code world. For America, code, code for America, code for America, Gen must code. I don't code, um, uh, but I have a basic understanding of how the digital world works. Um, that is something anybody can have, um, and I think it, when we sort of, um, when we, th this is true for elected leaders and for bureaucrats, when we send the signal that if you're not deeply, deeply technical, um, you're out of the conversation or you're not as smart as the other people in the room, it's very harmful. Um, we need a set of elected leaders who are just willing to understand what's at stake and willing to back digital leaders and say, okay, I might not really understand how this works, but this general approach that we're moving to, we're moving away from an approach that's very waterfall, many, many years in planning, um, you know, big, big IT projects that almost all fail, to a waterfall, iterative, user-centered, and data-driven process. You just need elected officials and th their leadership to say, I understand basically that that's better, and I'm willing to back that approach, even though it's gonna get attacked from time to time. I don't think we need like programmer in chief. I don't think we need our elected officials to be like, yeah, writing code. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, if, the, if you could collect the, and, and harness the, the genius of Silicon Valley and direct it towards one problem um, in the public sector, what would it be? It would actually be kind of that. Um, I don't think, I mean, it's incredibly difficult to do what I just talked about, to move from a very entrenched, very slow moving um, way of building and buying technology for government to a much more iterative and user centered one. But it's not impossible, and we've shown it working. USDS has shown it, Code for America has shown it, lots of states. Uh, and cities and counties have shown that they can do it without even help from fancy people from Silicon Valley. So as hard as it is, I think we are going to continue to prove that. What I think is the challenge is that like Congress and state legislatures and others don't know how to oversee it. Over you can't apply waterfall oversight to agile development. The funding is all wrong. The way we sort of hold people accountable. I mean, we like Silicon Valley is like super famous for saying fail fast. Congress does not like failing fast, even though they say they like it. Yeah. The minute you have a project, you know, sort of make a misstep, whew, everyone's on it. So we've got to, We've got to really retrain um, everyone. And I don't mean just Congress or state legislatures or. Um, Inspector General's offices, or you know, um, there's all there's this enormous oversight apparatus in government. But, but you know who is the worst oversight? Us, right? The American people have to start thinking differently about this. We actually have to let small failures, fast failures, um, uh, be okay. And I think if we demonstrate that, and particularly by the way, the press, right? Nope, this was a great small failure. They learned something. They're picking it up. They're building a new muscle. They're doing it right the next time. Like. We have to model that, and I think we can, um, but we, it's just so easy to beat up on government all the time. Yeah, and the expectations are so low. Like, this, the yeah. narrative's already established. We don't expect much from government, yeah. and therefore we expect that our expectations are low, and we, and, and we get the government we deserve. We, I completely believe that we get the government we deserve, and we better start acting differently if we want a different one. We've got about a minute left. Yeah. Have, what advice do you have for technologists in Silicon Valley that want to make an impact yeah. Uh, on a national level uh, or in their uh, in local county? Um, yeah, just do it, basically. Um, we have, uh, I, have I and my colleagues have recruited hundreds of people probably, most of whom will start out saying, not interested, not gonna do that, that sounds awful. Um, if you just take a taste of it, you will be both utterly horrified, I think, many times, um, at how hard it is and what it looks like, but I have yet to see people not become addicted to it because of the impact. Um, the, the best technologists and designers and product managers and technology and digital leaders, um, I think really respond when the thing that they, they see something that's very wrong and they know that their skills can fix it and we have that. So you just need to sort of like, you know, poke your head in, take a look, expose yourself to the issues and um, and then, and then I think you'll, I think you'll decide that it has to be part of your career, right? You don't have to go in for the rest of your life, but take some chunk of your career and do public service. And um, 
we, we actually put some of these really interesting jobs in government at cokemerica.org slash jobs. Um, but there's a million other ways to get involved, including working at the United States Judicial Service. Indeed. Well put. We're going to have to leave it there. But Jen Polka, thanks so much for your passion, your energy, and your commitment to making government work better. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.